the large number of uh, super alloys all those alloys which i showed you were of so called first generation alloys you remember i just skipped this slide uh, much earlier and yesterday somebody was asking the question how much strength we can get uh, at the temperatures of 1000 degree centigrade or more if you see those figures carefully we found that at 1000 we are uh, uh, left with hardly less than 400 uh, megapascal and so on and so forth now the next question is that can we increase the strength further now in the first generation alloy again coming back to the basic uh, definition of uh, super alloys is high strength high sustainable strength as well as corrosion resistance the corrosion resistance is by chromium and aluminium and strength is by various kinds of substitution solid solution elements and gamma prime gamma double prime ms uh, ceramic particles and so on and so forth right from the beginning when we are discussing high temperature corrosion we are always saying that uh, chromium and aluminium are the most important elements for corrosion resistance now here you will see a shift in a uh, strategy in gas turbine materials one of the prime factor which becomes important is the strength because the temperature involves are very very high so at uh, since the uh, gas turbine temperature are still much higher than that and in order to do that we are anyhow trying to do the various kinds of coatings thermal barrier coating which is basically a combination of bond coat and things like that so there is a chance to further enhance the strength and one of the most you know element which is good for corrosion resistance is bad for strength and you will be surprised to know that information i am trying to give you that the second third fourth and even fifth generation super alloys have been made by reducing chromium to as low as 3% and the strength benefit is tremendous and that's what i just want to show you that if you see this table where we have listed the first generation second generation and third generation and fourth and fifth are in the second slide the first generation things are all what we discussed chromium chromium forming alloys with chromium level 10 to 15 aluminium 1 to 6 depending upon alumina forming as well as gamma prime first formation and then host of substitution solid solution elements plus vanadium hafnium and other kind of things and when we make single crystals that is cmx2 cmx3 cmx4 and af56 there we suddenly see that many of these elements have been reduced now you see here hafnium has been reduced niobium has been reduced so as a result of this you reduce the Uh, these elements and enhance the melting temperature this is the strategy of stage 1 and if you remember and if you see that uh, uh, slide this is creep so if you see this slide that even at uh, 800 degree centigrade or 1000 degree centigrade 
800 itself, you get a final UTS of 400. And the maximum strength here is around 1115 or so, or 1100 megapascal or so. And now you will see that by reducing chromium, you can and adding something else, you can make alloys with much higher strength. So first I am just showing you the uh, composition of this thing. In second generation, if you just compare with that, this is single crystalline alloy with chromium reduced to 7. Uh, cobalt, molybdenum is also reduced to a greater extent. I will ask you this question, why molybdenum is reduced, what is the reason for that? Tungsten 6, tantalum 7, uh, so it is an alumina forming alloy, titanium 1 and other things. And then in other one, it is reduced to 5. You will see two important things in this compared to first and that, that the molybdenum level has been uh, reduced. And elements like uh, tungsten, tantalum, their concentration has been increased considerably. So which means what? That you are talking about, uh, uh, I mean you take corrosion resistance by aluminium only and the strength is further increased by adding elements like uh, higher concentrated tantalum element, but the most effective thing is the last thing, rhenium. And if you see in the periodic table, rhenium comes almost in the end. So you can see its radii and size is much larger than that. So this single element is creating a very strong change in the strength and the properties of the second generation thing. Now you go to third generation, again you see chromium is reduced to 2. Now you will see how the corrosion resistance will come into that. 4.2, 2.89, maximum chromium is 4 and rhenium is increased to almost double, 6, 5.4, 5 and other thing, other elements remaining same. This is something which is a very, very uh, a remarkable thing by which you have increased the strength to that level. And then you see generation 4th and 5th where we have created single crystals of TMS-138, chromium 3%, cobalt, this thing and, and another element is ruthenium. So a very strong substitutional solid solution strengthening along with the normal gamma prime and other kind of things which are already there. So if I, if we just uh, uh, summarize this, all these kind of things, what we have tried to achieve the second generation, third generation and fourth generation is reduce elements like chromium which do not give very strong help to the strengthening part of the alloy and since we are using this alloy as above 1100 degree centigrade or so, we take advantage of aluminium to create alumina alloys and if anything which is left, we are already trying to put thermal barrier coatings over there. So chromium is one element which is very important for corrosion resistance, but as you increase the concentration of chromium, the strength falls. So if you want to enhance the strength and reduce the uh, and, and uh, compensate this with the strength, then you have to reduce chromium in this fashion. And that is what as a matter of fact now in a single line you can say the second generation, third generation, fourth generation alloys are those super alloys which are of single crystalline or DS type which in which chromium is reduced to a greater extent and in, in place of that elements like rhenium which have the much, la much larger uh, size and in fourth uh, and fifth generation ruthenium, they are taken for the advantage of that. Clear? These are the 
yield, st uh, uh, yield strength and UTS at 400 and 750 degree centigrade. Now you can see CM uh, SX4, it is 860 and 950. So if you see this thing, you, you can see the strength that uh, uh, at, eight, uh, at 400 degree centigrade, it is 860 to 950. And at 750, it is still 950 and 1150. And for uh, third and fourth generation, it is even reaching to UTS to 1241 and 1308. So that is the strength. That is the strength of ruthenium ruth and ruthenium, which you add and replace it with chromium. That is the that is what they have created. See, if in, now if you just understand the whole diagram which I showed iron to this. Thing. We are trying to use the basic concept of SSS, precipitates and other kind of things. And the elements like for example, iron, cobalt, chromium, iron, coba uh, iron cobalt, nickel and chromium. These are the basic components of stainless steel also. But stainless steel can never achieve a strength more than, I mean, 900 or so. That is an that is also in high alloy stainless steels. So if you have to increase the strength to that level and that too at high temperature, I am not comparing the precipitation strength and stainless steel because they are only room temperature materials. They are not high temperature materials at all. So. Here to sustain the strength at high temperature, we are once again trying to use the SSS as the most important element and using rhenium and ruthenium as such. There is a data which is there uh, in, the, in the reference which I am just given into that. So, so I'm, I, I have not done research on that thing, but I am just trying to give a data information that. So, what I believe is that. Perhaps these elements uh, give the sustained strength at high temperature, which is better than at lower temperature. So this is something which is very, very, very. That's why we call it as a new generation super alloys. Single crystal, huh? CMX is a single crystal. All these are single crystals. These are all single crystals alloys. Single crystal fourth generation, single crystal. All these single crystals only. In single crystal, see, in single crystal, we have achieved 1300 degree melting point. What next? Much higher strength. See, the question is that the turbine blades which are there, which are facing a very high, a very high temperature, how they can sustain the strength at those temperatures? That is the most important thing which is there. Okay. So, what I expect from you is that. If you are asked a question, what is the development of super alloys, you must try to give a complete picture right from benefit of SSS, benefit of intermetallic precipitates, benefit of uh, ceramic oxide dispersions and introduction of very high uh, size atoms like ruthenium and rhenium. That is the complete picture which you have to get. Fine. I think that more or less completes the thing and now I want to come to this slide. Now I want to come to this slide and that is what is your test for the what you have learned and why this chapter is there. Now, I have just made three categories here, Incloy 800, then uh, nickel base alloys, then um, uh, Hayans and these kind of alloys. My simple question to this is that after spending, now I think it is almost uh, 10, 10, 10 hours of this thing in super alloys, we have already spent. If I give you some composition, like any of these composition and suppose I am an engineer and I am trying to build some component in a industry or even in the power or even in the aerospace industry and somebody asked me is this alloy suitable 
for 750 degree centigrade in only oxidizing environment, highly sulfidizing environment, hot corrosion environment and what will be its capability and durability. Can you explain the thing after going through this 10 hour lecture if this composition is given to you? I just just give me, I, I, of course I am going to tell you, but tell me if you have to proceed on this thing, how will you proceed? If the aluminium percent is like around 5 percent and chromium percent is 10 percent, then we can say it is alumina forming error. And if alumina forming error, then strength, uh, the, the strength which it can sustain higher temperature than chromium forming error. Correct. So, this is the systematic analysis. So, uh, but only thing your order has to be reversed. First is type of alloy. Uh, let me take this uh, uh, NS556 for example. Okay. So, what is this uh, NS56? Iron 29, nickel 21, chromium 22, aluminium 0.3, cobalt 20. So, what will be this alloy? It will be, as a matter of fact, uh, there is nothing like iron base, iron nickel base. That is the answer into that. Now, I, I, I will tell you that all these three alloys are already written as iron base category itself, mainly because here although iron is not the balance, but still its concentration is substantial. Like for example, if uh, 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 iron is 29, but you need only 8% uh, or 9% to make it austenitic, but nickel is still 21 quite high. So, both iron and nickel are in substantial quantities. So, it is a very good category of a iron nickel base alloy. Like in the first case also it is 45, 32, in the last case 55, 26, those are very clear. But in this case also it is iron nickel base. Compare you see in the downstairs 18.5 and 52, that is a very clear nickel base, 0.6 and 60. 0.6 and 60 or 2 and 56. So, it is very clear. Okay, So, that is the first differentiation. What you have to write is type of alloy. That is the first thing which you have to explain. Now, I will bring it in a minute. Second thing is strengthening mechanism. Now, in strengthening mechanism, what you will look into that? Systematically, you will look into first ISS, interstitial solid solutioning. You can see whether it is a carbon is there or not. So, you can just look into that. Now, in this case, carbon is 0.1. So, you can say interstitial solid solution by carbon, which is 0.1. Clear? that is we call A and what is the next? SSS. Now, just see from the beginning what is the thing which is coming? Nickel, chromium, aluminium, cobalt, molybdenum. So, molybdenum is 3 percent, next tungsten 2.5 percent, niobium 0.1, zirconium, boron, tantalum 0.5. Okay. So, these are the main substitutional solid solution elements. 
करेक्ट वट इज द थर्ड थिंग प्रेसिपिटेशन स्ट्रेंथनिंग नो इन प्रेसिपिटेशन स्ट्रेंथनिंग अगेन इन प्रेसिपिटेशन स्ट्रेंथनिंग अगेन यू आर वट यू वट यू हैव टू डू वेन कार्बन इज प्रेजेंट द फर्स्ट थिंग इज कार्बाइड फॉर्मेशन सो इन दैट्स वाई इन दिस से आई विल से कार्बाइड फॉर्मेशन नो इन कार्बाइड फॉर्मेशन विच आर द एलिमेंट्स विच विल फॉर्म कार्बाइड फॉर्मेशन we have molybdenum carbide we have tungsten carbide we have niobium carbide mainly others may be also there but these are the main okay now third uh, second is intermetallic precipitation now this is where you have to now understand now just seeing this alloy which has 0.3% aluminum niobium so what do you expect what kind of intermetallic should be there Ni3Al and Ni3Nb. Now Ni3Nb in such case is very difficult to form because to form Ni3Nb, if you see the phase diagram, you need a around five percent of niobium. So under these condition, it is basically gamma prime. That is Ni3 aluminium. Understand? So you have to just remember those kind of things. Some more details about that thing. You 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 cannot just write this thing and say no no no, niobium is there. It will form in that. For aluminium, even if it is 0.1 percent, Ni3Al will form. Titanium, even if it is 0.1 percent, Ni3 titanium will form. But niobium, you have a problem that until unless it has around 5 percent or so, Ni3 gamma double prime will not form. Clear? so that is the only thing and then again you see aluminium is only 0.3 so 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 far we have just seen these three things carbide intermetallic okay now what is the next thing d what is next grain boundary grain boundary strengtheners which are these boron boron and zirconium then e grain boundary refiner what is that vanadium theek okay? hai so this is what we have explained on the strengthening part okay now we come back to now next thing oxidation and corrosion resistance okay now what we are going to do here first whether it is a chromium former or alumina former there is a 22% chromium so it is a clear case of chromium former very clear it is a chromium former so i think the rest of the thing is no need of discussing of that so what will be the next thing to discuss now you see there is a element lanthanum or yttrium what is the use of that active element effect which means that they will strengthen this chromia layer and make it much better so this is a positive effect of oxidation before we go for uh, telling its durability and uh, temperature capability i want to also find out possibilities of tcp phases what are tcp phases unwanted phases leves phase chi phase eta phase sigma phase and so on and so forth now if you see here in this case how will you see that what is the possibility in that for that you have 2.5% of uh, tungsten 3% of molybdenum and 22% of chromium so there is a very big chance of which phase formation all the three are which kind of stabilizers are there ferritic stabilizer so if ferritic stabilizers are of that concentration then the chances of sigma phase formation is very much there so you have explained tcp phases also now you have explained almost everything now you have to give your opinion based upon this information what is the capability of this material for any high temperature application see 
Sigma phase doesn't form in two days, three days, or ten days, or one year. Sigma phase forms in ten years, five years. What we have to look into that if there are strong ferritic stabilizing form, uh, forming elements, there is a possibility of their segregation. If these three elements are lying separate, then for the whole life nothing will happen. But due to the fact that this whole process is a heating, cooling and aging process, the chances are that these elements can segregate. If they segregate, then the formation of sigma phase cannot be avoided. So we have to look into that possibility. We are not saying it will form. We are only saying the possibilities in long run about the sigma phase formation. That is what is uh, required from you that you have to go into the depth of this composition and try to find out what are the good points, what are the bad points. So until and unless these things are uh, understood, you will, you will not be making a full analysis of the whole thing. Clear? Now you have to talk about the capability. Now what you can say about temperature capability? First you can consider the capability from the strength point of view. See, you have to think systematic way, how you have to think. You cannot think the second point first and make your error in your judgment. So when you have to think of the capability, first think from the strength point of view. Now that's why I'm asking the first question from strength point of view, up to what temperature you can use this material? You have found out so many strengthening elements, molybdenum, tungsten. So there is a very good solid solution strengthening. But what is lacking here is gamma prime. Gamma prime is there, but the concentration is very less. You remember I showed you the curve that the strength of the alloy keeps on changing with large concentration of gamma prime. I, I don't know whether I showed you this curve which, which was uh, versus strength. This thing come at 9 percent. So here it is point somewhere we are here. And solid solution strengthening alone with these elements cannot take you to much higher temperature. So I will try to give this alloy a temperature capability of between 850 to 900 only from strength point of view. So you have to first decide that. Now you say from uh, oxidation point of view, it has already a limit of 900 degrees centigrade. So the capability of this material is between 850 to 900 in a reasonably good manner. And this is what is the message you get from analyzing this thing. Have you, you know, you know, this is the way you have to, I mean, the way we have written this thing, you have to answer it exactly in this fashion. Don't go the final point first and then confuse yourself. We are studying subject of corrosion, but I am putting mechanical properties as the first because you cannot uh, make a material corrosion resistant if it is mechanically not stable. So you have to, your think process should be in a systematic manner to understand you know what you are really learning out of that. Clear? But now you see in your alloy where, you, where the point is coming. So if you say my point is coming somewhere here, I will say oh, it is good. I, I, I don't know point 1 will make how much. But I am what I am trying to say is that at point 1 my strength increase up to this point. So that, that is the judgment which you have to put. You have to bring that things in, in your mind. See when you solve a problem. 10 hours, whatever you have read, you have to bring it together.
and try to answer the question in that fashion. So, I will take one more example. Yeah, this is a typical example in Cornell 718. And I will give you a very strong message of this thing after I finish it. In Cornell 718, iron 18.5, nickel 52.5, chromium 19, aluminium 0.5, molybdenum 3, titanium 0.9, niobium 5.1, carbon 0.08.15. Okay. Now start this exercise. Number one, type of alloy. Of course, obvious we have written there nickel base. Strengthening mechanism. A, ISS because there is a 0 0.08 carbon. ISS due to carbon. B, SSS. What are the SSS here? Molybdenum 3, titanium. Molybdenum, titanium, niobium and that is all. Copper has no role in this. Okay. What is third? Precipitation strengthening number one carbide. So, carbide what do you expect? Molybdenum carbide, titanium carbide. Okay. Intermetallics. Now, this is a tricky question. Now, tell me about intermetallics. Ni3 Nb, as I told you, since niobium is above 5 percent, so Ni3 Nb will be one of the things. What is this called? Gamma double prime. What else? Ni3 Al and Ni3 Ti, because as I told you, aluminium and uh, uh, titanium, even if they are present of 0.1 percent, and especially when I, I think this is something I, uh, I, I, I do not know whether I have told you or not. Suppose there is a alloy, there is only say point, uh, to, to say 2 percent titanium, there is no aluminum at all. So, it has only one eta Ni3 titanium, it is a gamma prime, very stable, but if you see the capability of eta, if you just go through this uh, notes, you will find that that also destabilizes above uh, 7 to 800 degree centigrade. But if a small amount of gamma prime is there, then eta becomes very, very strong and in that case, we do not represent Ni3 Al and titanium as independent precipitates, but we, we represent it as Ni3 Al titanium. And when Ni3 Al titanium is there, it has a very strong effect on the strengthening. Okay. Then we have no grain boundary strengthening, no grain refine, all these things are missing. This since they are missing, but you have to write. Although they are missing, because they are part of the strengthening mechanism, so you must write so that I can understand that you know that these elements are missing into that, because that will help you to decide the strength. Okay. None of these elements are there. Now comes third part, oxidation and corrosion. Now what do you tell about that? Chromium 19 percent, aluminum is 0 0.5. So again it is a chromia former. Okay. Now about its temperature capability. Ah, TCP phases. TCP phases, I will say less. Although chromium is 19 and because 19 chromium is not that high and molybdenum is only, only one molybdenum, uh, this thing is there. So, the chances of TCP phase formation is relatively less. But if you have lots of these elements present, molybdenum, tantalum, titanium, uh, then layers phase formation is also there. 
layer stress formation is any two metals can segregate and form AB2 type of unwanted compounds. Okay. So, in this case, even this formation is not that good. So, what is the temperature capability? The what is the major intermetallic here? Gamma double prime, 5 percent niobium. So, first you have to differentiate that. See the major element is niobium. So, it is gamma double prime which is the main intermetallic elements. Now, I, I think I told you that there is a problem with gamma double prime. Gamma double prime is stable only up to 750 degree centigrade. After that, it changes to it changes the microstructure and it effect goes into that. So, that is one of the biggest limitation of IN 718 in terms of that beyond 750 its strength will not be very good. So, that is why its temperature limit is 750 although it has some strength things available with Ni3 TAL gamma prime and eta, but then their concentration is not that high. So, the damage which will which it will cause after 750 due to the destabilization of gamma double prime that will be more dominant compared to the small benefit it will get from eta and gamma prime. So, that is the way you have to explain the whole thing. Okay. So, although the temperature capability, uh, corrosion capability, oxidation capability is up to 900 degree centigrade, but from the strength limitation, this alloy cannot be used above 750 degree centigrade. So, that is the, understand? So, these are the catches in each such kind of things. Achha, ek point, I have not discussed one point uh, in previous thing also in this. I have told only oxidation resistance. We have to also talk about sulfidation and hot corrosion resistance. So, both these alloys which we have discussed, what is their sulfidation resistance, good or bad? For sulfidation, if you find in an alloy chromium more than 15, you close your eyes and say it is best for sulfidation and hot corrosion. Aluminium is not good for sulfidation. Even if it is a alumina forming alloy, like somebody tell 10 chromium and 5 aluminium, it is very good. It is although it is alumina forming, but it is a bad sulfidizing resistance alloy. If it is a alumina forming and chromium concentration is high, then it will be sulfidation form uh, resistance also. So, thumb rule, alumina will form with minimum 10 chrome and 5 aluminium. But this 10 chrome and 5 aluminium is good only for oxidation resistance. If you wanted sulfidation resistance, chromium should be at least above 15 or around 15. In general, I will give you second thumb rule. If you find in an alloy chromium more than 15, you can say very uh, good sulfidation resistance. And if chromium is around 20, excellent for sulfidation resistance. So, chromium and sulfidation go hand in hand. Alumina forming, how best it will be, it is not a very good sulfidation resistance. For sulfidation resistance, chromium should be the highest. Clear? Now, I want you this table and I have not written some of this CMX alloy. Suppose there is a CMX alloy along with that then you have to explain everything like that except 
you can talk about its temperature capabilities much higher than 13 uh, much higher than 1200 degree centigrade because of single crystalline or directionally solidified thing and if you find second or third generation alloy then you can say their capabilities strength capabilities are much better this is the crux of the whole thing hot correction part uh, one more factor that will influence what the kind of the base of whether it is cobalt uh, based or nickel based or iron based alloy that's also last time we read actually yeah 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 that is that is from the uh, see in general if you see sulfidation and hot corrosion after 900 degree centigrade it has no meaning because most of the sulfidation if it is a nickel base alloy but if it is a iron base alloy 900 is important 900 plus is important but that is i mean talking in a uh, in a when you specifically talk about that kind of thing but in a super alloy when you have to compare with this kind of thing because i'm not asking a specific thing into you should know the trend from that point of view it is very important yes last year when we studied about this iron alloys and cobalt alloys and nickel alloys the nickel alloys are best at higher temperature and iron alloys are best at lower temperature